Hi everyone, we're back to our Node.js Global Summit. Hey Armando, Hello. would you like to present our next uh, speaker? Yeah, totally. Well, hey everyone, again, welcome back to the Node.js Summit. Um, our next speaker is Marcus. He's a passionate full stack developer and DevOps engineer, particularly interested in JavaScript and GraphQL. He contributes back to open source in projects like Gatsby and Yokubu, which is a personal project of his. Um, and he also gives meetups and organizing OGS Vienna meetups. Today, he's going to take us through the, the path uh, to ECMAScript 6 modules. He will take us back in time and show us what the future holds for modules in Node. Um, yeah. Hi, Marcus. Welcome Hi. to the stage. Hey. Yeah. How's it going? Uh, is it your first online conference or not? Yes, it is. So five out of five. Very well. That's great. <laughs> All right. Tell us a few words about uh, yourself, about what's your uh, current topic about and uh, what actually drives you in Node.js, and then you can, can start and go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I've been doing a lot of programming for the last three years. And uh, when I uh, sold Node.js got popular, I experimented with it, and so I stuck with it because it's awesome and yeah still use it today and that's why i'm here that's great thank you marcus uh we are ready to launch it to the stream so please go ahead enjoy it <clears throat> also thank you we will we at the last five minutes we'll get back we'll just for a few seconds we'll say five minutes left and two minutes left and one minute left so we uh we will moderate that in case of any questions just please let us know we are here so okay. now it's your glory time. We are disconnecting here. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to my talk about modules. Now in this talk, I want to go through the different uh, module specifications which have evolved over time in the JavaScript ecosystem and also show you some examples on how those modules can be used. Now, about myself, my name is Marco Tösel. I'm a web developer at a Vienna-based company, and I am also a lecturer at a university in Vienna. I do some open source contributions and also organize meetups and give talks. Now, before diving into the JavaScript-related part, let's just recap what the concept of a module is. The module help us to organize our code in a better way. We can group uh, stuff together, functions, and so on, which belongs together. So it, that way, our code gets more organized. And then we can set clear boundaries on which functions to, should be exposed to the outside world. So we can encapsulate code, we create clear boundaries, and how our developers can interact with the module. Now, a module typically has some uh, dependency on the runtime it's executed. So in our case, let's say Node.js has a runtime support for common JS modules. And that's for that reason, we can use common JS in Node.js without uh, anything around it. Now, there's also another concept of A and B modules, uh, which have been used in the browser. However, no browser uh, supported A and B modules in its runtime. So what we needed to uh, use an AMD model in a browser is a model loader. Also, if you came up, for example, with your own uh, model concept and you want to reuse it in Node.js, chances are pretty big that Node.js won't add it to the runtime. So you would need to write your own model loader, which translates the model into something which is processable by Node.js. So here's a very easy example of how a model looks like. It typically consists of three parts. The first one are imports. So they are optional, but most modules have dependencies on other modules. And we can specify them uh, at the top of the file in ES modules with the import keyword and then use them. Then we have some private stuff going on. Uh, for example, functions or variables. It should not be directly accessible by other developers who use the module. So those stay private. Here in this case, we have this fighter variable, which is a string array. And then what we did here is we uh, um, exposed a function called pick winner to the outside world using the export keyword. 
uh, from the AES model application. And in that way, another uh, user of our module can interact with that. Now, JavaScript didn't have the concept of model right from the beginning. Um, so this was really a big design flow, and it was said that JavaScript isn't usable for big projects because it's missing a model concept, it's missing uh, the concept of multiple namespaces. And because of that, uh, different stuff evolved over time. So we have uh, multiple model systems, we have uh, bundlers, we have model loaders, and a lot of terms which uh, came up over the last few years. And in this talk, I want to go through the most important terms and show you also with examples on how, why those terms exist and what they're actually for. Now, back in the early days of JavaScript, no model concept was introduced yet. And so some developers, mostly beginners, just pushed everything onto the global namespace. So this namespace solution that occurred happened when show, uh, code, which should be organized into separated namespaces, is all brought together into one uh, common namespace. Now to get around this, uh, people started to use ifis. So an ify helps us to create a private scope in the current scope, the script is executed. And with this private scope, we've been able to make stuff private, which we don't want to uh, expose to the outside world. So I've probably you've already seen that there, I have also my uh, coding editor open here. And I want to go through two examples now and explore how namespace pollution occurred and how we got around it using this. So, in here, in the first example, we have this library, Battle.js. Let's say we want to develop a small game. And this library has a variable in here, which is a string array, and then it has two functions. And everything which we define in here lands on the global namespace. Now, let's say this function was written by some random developer, and we create a main JS file where we use this library. Now, because it's available on the global namespace, we can directly call this function here and assign a result to this variable, which also is then pushed onto the global namespace. And in this index HTML file, we can then load both scripts. And it's important here to uh, keep the order that way because main.js relies on, Sorry, because main.js relies on battle.js. So battle.js has to be loaded up front. And once the DOM is loaded, we can make use of these variables because they're available on the global namespace. So if we open up this example now, we can see uh, what this uh, application looks like. And if we open up our console, we can see that we can, for example, directly interact with our uh, string array here. We can also like call the Function because everything is now on the global namespace. And now, probably some other developers also writing a library which you want to use, and he's also like defining a, a variable called fighters. So it's coming to naming pollution, and that led to uh, weird runtime errors because everyone can interact with the stuff with uh, pushed on that namespace. And to get around that, uh, the concept of ifs uh, has been used. Now, if we take a look at an if, we can see that our battle.js library now looks a bit different. We have this battle object here, and we push this to the global namespace. But that's the only thing from the battle.js library which is exposed. So then we have this function, and this function is immediately invoked. Therefore, the term immediately invoked function expression. And what we can see here is that we also, def uh, also define this fighter. A variable and then our two functions, but we only push those two functions onto this battle object. And if we take a look at the main JS file, we then access the battle um, object and call the two functions which we have exposed. We then write the result back into those two variables and push them on the global namespace as well, just for the sake of this uh, example. And in our index HTML file, there are uh, no change happened. So that's the same file with some uh, theme previously. And if you open up this example, we can see 
it looks the same. But if we try to exit our fighters um, variable, we get an error because now that's private. As, well, as we can see here, we do not expose this fighter uh, variable directly. And that's really a nice way on how to create uh, like a model without having a model system in place. All right. So in 2008, 2009, when Node.js came along, um, also some other stuff like CommonJS and NPM got popular. And so Node.js decided to use uh, the CommonJS model uh, specification uh, in order to have modules available on this server-side runtime. A common JS itself is a collection of standards. It has a standard for modules and for local and remote package management and packages. It also has standards for streaming and file access and a lot more. And common JS not only is used by Node.js, but also by other projects like MongoDB or CouchDB or RingoJS, for example. But because the standard process took a while. Node.js later on decided to drop the support for the specification they came up with and do their own thing. So that was kind of the goal for CommonJS because it's no longer used by Node.js, which was a big project. And so it was only active till 2014, and now it's uh, not uh, it's kind of dead. However, which was fully implemented in Node.js is the concept of the CommonJS module. And that's the reason why we can use CommonJS modules in Node.js natively. So using it in Node.js is fine, but uh, there are also front-end developers who wanted to make use of these NPM packages, for example, and this CommonJS module. However, because the specification said that the module should be loaded synchronously, it wasn't really a good uh, fit for the browser. And mostly because of that, browser vendors did not add support for the common JS module specification. Now, one way to get around this was that you as a front-end developer still write your application using the common JS um, module and then use a bundler which goes through the uh, dependency graph and uh, smashes, smashes everything which is required by your application into one JavaScript file into one bundle, and that is then loaded and uh, can be executed by the browser. So I've also added uh, examples for that. Um, let's just switch over here. And in this fourth example, we can see how a model looks like when using the common JS specification. So we already know this part up here. Now we have this model.export, where we tell the uh, uh, we tell Node.js, for example, or someone who's using this model in its runtime, what we want to expose. And in main.js, we make use of the model by saying we're requiring it. So we require a battle and assign the result to this variable. And then we can execute the expose function and uh, store the result in our variable. So this is a Node.js example now. And if we execute this on the command line, it should work. Because uh, the board for common JS is into Node. Now, if we want to use uh, common JS packages in the browser, uh, it's a bit more uh, complicated. So we still have our module, our common JS module, nothing changed. In our main JS file is also the same, except that we don't print the result to the console, but push it under our window object so we have it available in our index.html file. Now, for this example, I added the browserify bundler. So we are NPM, therefore I have to node modules folder. And uh, here you can see which command I've used to create the bundle. So I use browserify pointed it to the main entry file. It traversed through the whole dependency graph and pushed everything together into the bundle.js file. So if you have a look at here, uh, everything which we need for our application is pushed into this one file. And this can be processed by the browser. So if you take a look at our index HTML file, we can see that we only require this uh, JavaScript bundle. And if we execute uh, this uh, example here using the command line, 
token and up in the browser, we can see uh, it still works the way it was designed for us. And uh, yeah, but uh, stuff which should be private is private, like this fighter array, but uh, other stuff which we push onto our window object in our main JS file is accessible through the global namespace. So we have a really nice uh, isolation with this approach. Now, there are still some uh, negative things about that. And so other specifications came along. And under the hood of web modules, uh, we can uh, AMD go define, which is the asynchronous module definition. And this uh, allows us to uh, load modules into an asynchronous fashion. And this uh, was, uh, and those models then have been used by the browser. Now, because AMD was also not implemented by the browser vendor, we needed a loader to load AMD modules. And the most popular one was Require.js. So using Require.js, we've been able to execute our AMD, uh, to prepare our AMD modules so that the browser or some other en uh, environment can make use of it. So we now had AMD and common JS and some uh, model developers who wanted to create a model uh, usable on both platforms had to create two modules. And that's the reason another specification came along, the universal model definition. And that's not a spec per se, but it's uh, more like what UMD does, it tries to find out in which uh, environment executed and then to expose the uh, the code uh, using the uh, appropriate model um, system. So we can also explore uh, like how AMD and UMD models are used. So let's jump back over here and now we can see how an AMD model looks like. So the syntax is quite different to common GS. We now have this define method up here, which has an array of dependencies for our function here. And as soon as these requirements or these dependencies are loaded, they got injected, get injected into this function and we can make use of it. Now, we don't use this require function, so we could delete it, but we use this export function to tell the uh, system which function we want to expose. So we expose the function, but the fight that there is stays private. And in our main JS file, you can see uh, we're using an AMD model as well. But here, because uh, our, um, our main JS file re uh, requires battle, we uh, add it to the dependencies. So those dependencies are loaded asynchronously, therefore they are not blocking the event loop, which is a pretty bad thing to do, uh, especially in the browser. And loading the model asynchronously on what we depend on, uh, it can also be loaded in parallel. And so it's much, much faster and this approach is therefore uh, uh, really better. So we can open up, uh, let's explore the index HTML file as well. So here we can see that we include our main JS file, but because that the browser doesn't understand AMD, we are using the required JS loader, which we have found here. So I've added the required JS loader, and this does uh, some transformation to the code so that the browser can uh, understand uh, this uh, stuff which we have specified. So if we open up this in our browser, we can see the same result. The application is working fine. And now we have nothing uh, pushed on our global namespace because we've used the approach of the AMD modules. So because uh, now a developer would need to write a common JS module and an AMD module, which is cumbersome, the UMD specification came up and here we can see how this looks like. So what a, a UMD tries is to find out if it's running in node and if so, it uses the model.export to export the module. Otherwise, it checks if AMD is available and if so, it uh, exposes the module as an AMD module. So we can, uh, okay, 
So in our main chest file, the same thing is going on. And in our index HTML file, like compared to the last example, nothing changed. Changed. We still use our required JS data loader to load our main JS file. But because of UMD, uh, UMD realized that, okay, it's running in the browser, so it exposes our uh, module as an AMD module. So if we open this up in the browser, you can see the same result. It works fine. So because this uh, UMD module is still able for more environments, we can also execute it, use it, uh, using um, Node.js. So if we execute this function now, uh, this command here now, we can see the result. So that's because uh, the UMD loader realized, okay, I'm running now in a Node environment because module and module.export is available. So I can expose it via common JS and therefore Node knows how to handle it and we can run our program. Now, with all these uh, specifications uh, which came up, uh, the ECMAScript uh, standardization group finally decided to create their own uh, module specification. And with that, ES model came along with uh, the ES6 standard. And this was the first uh, module specification which was integrated into the browser. So that means we can now I uh, use ES modules native in the browser without relying on a bundler or without relying on a module reloader. And that's pretty nice. So ES modules also have some other advantages compared to common JS. They support asynchronous loading, also they support tree shaking and that code elimination so we get rid of our unused code. And they also have support for dynamic import. So we don't need to import everything up front. But we can import stuff later on, or we can also decide if we want to import it or not, depending on the use case. So in an if else block, for example, we can only make use of the module in the if block because it's only needed there. So um, ES modules have a very nice syntax, at least as my, my personal uh, thought about it. Uh, so if we take a look at that JS again, we can see our fighter um, string array still says private and to expose our function we use this export keyword here and here. Now in our main JS file, we make use of the import statement defined by the ES model uh, specification to import our exposed functions from the data JS library. We then assign the result of the two function code to this uh, variables here. And in our index HTML, we can make use of it. But here we have only one script tag uh, left. And we say that this is a type module, and therefore we can use the import statement and import our stuff from the main JS file. And then we can directly use it in our application. So we open this up in Chrome, it should still work fine. But now under the hood, uh, ES modules are used. Okay, sorry, that's of course issues. Let's open it up using a um, web server. All right, so now I loaded fine. And if we take a look at our network tab, we can also see like how these calls have, are done. So we do request in the index, index HTML file, and then the main JS uh, dependency is loaded and this. Uh, Result that the data JS uh, dependency is loaded as well. Now, because Node.js already had a model system in place, it got a bit more complicated in the Node.js environment. However, first up is today, the ES models are fully uh, supported by the Node.js runtime. That means we can use ES models in Node.js and it's quite fine. And they also added some interoperability between the common JS and the ES model um, specification. Now, ES model support was first added with Node.js 8.5. It was around uh, summer 2017, but you needed to uh, add this experimental model flag to it. Now, after this was released, the Node.js committee formed the model team and they did a rewrite of the implementation. And this rewrite was released with Node 12.0, which was released around uh, March um, last year. 
And then finally, with Node 13.2, the support for this flag was dropped. So now it's safe to use this module. And this was released in November last year. Now the new implementation was done in five phases. The first one was just a fresh start, so everything was talked out about how things should be done. Then the minimal kernel was written with very, very basic functionality so that ES models can be loaded. And then more complicated stuff was pushed onto it in the second phase here uh, to make a, to make a minimum viable product. And then in phase three, a lot of refactoring was going on to make the implementation uh, really stable. And with the end of the phase three, the experimental model cycle was uh, dropped. And we are currently in this phase four, so there's still a work going on, like small further improvements. So we are not finished yet, but uh, the implementation is already very, very stable and uh, ready to do. Now, because um, we have now two different model systems in place, uh, Node.js came up, uh, the Node.js developer came up with two new file extensions. So if you want to write an ES module, which uh, should be used in the Node.js ecosystem, uh, you should use the use of the .mjs file ending. And if you want to stick with the common JS uh, specification, you should uh, add the DJS file extension to your module. Now, if you package your model up, there's another way on how to specify if it's an ES model or common JS model. And this is by adding the type field to your package.json. And if you set it to the module value, then the Node.js runtime knows uh, uh, this package, this model, is an ES model and uses the ES model loader. Otherwise, if the field is missing or if it's set to common JS, then um, node loads it at the common JS module. So chances are that when you write an ES module, that you probably from time to time want to use a common JS module. And you can do this by making use of a default import. And also the other way around, like adding an ES module or using an ES model in a common JS module is uh, supported by using a dynamic import. And yeah, we can take a look at those examples and explore on how this interoperability and how ES modules uh, work in practice. So we are now at the ninth example, and we can see here I have this battle.mjs file. So I'm making now use of this new file extension. The rest of the company is already known, so this is an ES module and it is exposing two methods. And in our main.mjs file, we then make use of the exposed methods by first importing them and then executing them and printing the result, which we assign to the variables on the command line. So if I now uh, execute this with node and execute the main.mjs file, we can still see that it works. And that's because right now I'm using a node with version 14.0. Zero. Now, if I switch back, for example, to an older version and try it again, you can see that we get an error because now in this version, I needed to set the flag so that I can execute the example. You can see now that in this version, um, 12.13, we get a warning, but we can still use it uh, with the flag. So let's just switch back to this newer version now and explore how the interoperability works. So let's jump to the tenth example. In here we have the battle JS um, module. And you can see here that this is a common JS module. And if you take a look at our main MJS file, which is an ES module, we can see that we make an import and uh doing the Using it this way, we're creating a default import, and so we can make use of the common JS module. So we import everything into this battle uh, variable, and over this variable, we then can can then uh, execute the function which has been which have been exposed by the battle JS library. And if we try this example. 
you can see that it works fine as well. So we, what we did now is we executed a ES model in Node.js, which has a dependency yeah. on a common JS. Let me try this example. You can see that and yes. Arthur, sorry, uh, yeah. your your volume uh, on the microphone got got bad. Could you please try again one more time? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now it's much better. Thank you. Sorry for disturbing. Okay. Okay. Really sorry that the volume did not work out. I hope it's now fine. So we are at this uh, last example right here, where we have this battle.mgs file. And this is an ES module, which we want to use in our main.gs file. So in order to use this ES module now, we can uh, make execute this import uh, function uh, and pass the battle.mgs dependency along. Now, because this uh, returns a promise, we have to await it. And then we can use the expose function by using the thread operator and execute the, uh, the imported function. Because we've used the um, uh, promise here and the wait keyword, we need to wrap every, everything up in this async function. And executing it on the bottom finally makes this example work. So on the command line, if I execute this now, you can see this works as well, like using an ES module in a normal in a normal JavaScript file. Yeah, this was my last example. So one more time back to the slides. Um, I guess uh, with this ESM uh, implementation Node.js, we will see more and more um, packages uh, packaged up as ES modules. And people can do this uh, either by hand, which is uh, cumbersome, but also can use like uh, transformers, standalone transformers, or uh, this bubble plugin, for example. And then there's also the way of uh, creating dual mode packages. So doing this, you add the common JS module as well as the ES module into the package. And you also add a package to JSON where you define the default uh, use. So if you say you want that uh, by default, it should be used as an ES module, then people can use the bare import to make use of it. So they can say import X from Y. And if they want to uh, use the common JS module, they would need to make a deep import. That means... Mm -hmm. that So that means that um, they have to say require from um, slash EGS, for example. Now, this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope it was interesting for you and you gained some new knowledge. Uh, thanks for listening and happy to answer your questions. Well, uh, thank you so much, Marcus. This was very great. Um, I believe a lot of people will have a lot of questions uh, about your, the subject you just brought up. Uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Yeah. How do you feel? This is this is your first like uh, uh, online conference as well, right? That you're speaking as an online conference. Yes, yes, yes. It's the first time. Yeah. How is the experience so far? Yeah, I think I managed it. Yeah. I hope uh, everything was okay with the volume. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think everything was just fine. And uh, it looks like the people, the, everyone liked a lot your, your presentation. Thank you so much. That was lovely. OK, thank you. Well, um, we're going for a break now before our next Q&A session. Um, we'll be back in uh, five minutes. So yeah, give yourself a break. Uh, go for a coffee, take some water, Yeah, walk around, stretch your back. Just go for it. We'll be back in five.